In the Pause. This is In Goal Radio, the podcast. I'm Darren Millard, along with the co-founders of In Goal Magazine, David Hutchison and Kevin Woodley. And as we gear up for the return of the National Hockey League, we're looking at a couple of different things uh, around the goaltending world. And our feature interview this week is somebody that's getting ready to go back to work in Europe, J.P. Lamoureux. It's a fascinating interview about a player that played four years at UND, a goaltender that uh, decided to make the early switch in his career to playing in Europe and has really shined in the Austrian league. Let's bring in the uh, the guys and uh, Woody and Hutch. As I was uh, raking uh, around my brain looking for something to talk about, actually, I was riding my bike the other day and it uh, jumped into my head. If we're looking at this pause as this sort of summer situation where guys get back to training and they work out. Uh, they also experiment with different gear during the course of a summer. Do you think, Woody, that some guys will decide to switch gear from what they used at the pause uh, to the return to play? Well, we're already seeing signs of it in training camp and obviously all the uh, the Instagram accounts have been all over it as teams come back and post pictures. The one to me that was the biggest surprise um, was David Riddich, just because uh, we'd seen him testing out some Bauer ultrasonic uh, back home in, in the Czech Republic. And he came back to Calgary and he was wearing that and everybody got excited, said, looks like it's a permanent switch. And a day later, he was in Lefebvre gear and everyone's like, okay, hold on. Uh, in between those two, I actually texted his goalie coach, Jordan Sigalette, uh, and he actually said, like, pump the brakes there, uh, despite others maybe not pumping the brakes uh, on the Bauer stuff. He wasn't 100% sure. So to me, I look at it in two ways. I'm a little bit surprised just because you've got to cut. You There's no, this can't, you can't be Corey Crawford halfway through a season wearing a set of pads in the first period and then going back to your old pads in the second period like he did this year because he was trying something new. Pretty sure that's not going to fly in the playoffs. You better have your crap dialed in once they drop the puck for real. So Because it's such a short window from back on the ice to back into games compared to the summer, like in the summer, guys try stuff in July and August, and then they get their stuff dialed in mid-September, they're in in with their teams. This is, some guys are just getting back on the ice now, and they're back into training camp on July 10th, possibly the 13th, we're hearing. Um, That's not a lot of time to get it dialed in. So in that respect, Riddich surprised me that he is still considering the Bauer. That's still an option. He's having a little trouble with the glove. Like the feel on the Bauer glove is different to him. And that's why he's now looking at the Lefebvre. Because of course he was in CCM and who made the CCM glove when we left? Lefebvre. And now that we're back, Lefebvre doesn't make CCM glove. He's trying the Lefebvre pads, the whole setup and the glove. It'd be interesting to see uh, in, in the text back and forth, I said, like, you know, as Mike Liut tells all his clients, and we heard from Corey Schneider, you're going to get paid a lot more to stop pucks looking like a mutt than you're going to get paid to wear one set of gear head to toe. So I'll be curious. I mean, you could see potentially um, David Riddich in Bauer pads, Bauer blocker, and a Lefebvre glove. Like, that's a possibility here. Now, the one part, the reason I find it surprising, or a lot of people are going to find it surprising, they're going to look at Riddich. And they're going to be like Bauer E-Flex, or sorry, CCM E-Flex to Bauer Ultrasonic. Like that's a soft, flexible pad with knee rolls to a pad that is, you know, stiffer and straighter. Uh, We know about the the knee, the Stabilin knee. Um, We know about the innovations that's in the Bauer Ultrasonic, but at the end of the day, it's still more of a rigid, stiff pad. Um, And that seems like a dramatic change. But if you read the Axis review that we did at ingoalmag.com last Friday of the new CCM Axis. Yeah, just up. One of those, one of the elements that they've tried to capture in Axis is an element that NHL goaltenders have been asking for and for about three years now getting in their eFlex pads. And that is eFlex flexibility down in the boot and from the shin up to the top, a stiffer profile. That's been available at Pro. Of course, that means that's been available through Lefebvre. And that's what they've tried to capture in Axis. Now, people don't realize that Lefebvre and CCM started developing Axis together before the split, and then they went their separate ways. So the new Lefebvre pad has components of Axis in it. So when we see Riddich um, switching out of an E-Flex, and everybody goes, oh, well, how's he going from an E-Flex to a stiff pad? The reality is, and and I look back at his strapping because we have some photos of it, he wore it loose. He didn't wear it tight to his leg. 
there's actually like a one inch gap as he's in his stance between his knee and his knee pad or the knee stack and the knee pad. Like, so the pad sits lower. He doesn't wear it tight at all. And so that transition, whether it ends up being to an ultrasonic or to the new Lefebvre pad is not going to be as big a transition as most people in their mind might see it because he was in a soft E-flex before. The reality is he was in an E-flex with a stiff profile and he wore it loose. Well, I'm really sorry to pop that at you because uh, it's obvious that you haven't done any thinking about it at all. The funny, uh, the funny thing is, that. I hadn't really thought. I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it. But just, I mean, this is these are the things that rattle around in my brain. Um, and we, you know, we're having these conversations. We know what the how these pads are being made. We that's that's who we are, I guess. At Ingle, Hutch, I don't know how many coaches would even know that a goaltender is wearing a different manufacturer uh, coming out of the the pause than going into it. But this is the reaction I anticipate a coach having when somebody tells him, hey, your goalie's wearing brand X instead of brand Y. Snapzilla. Because the stakes yeah. are, are, are so high. <laughs> Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I agree. I don't think many coaches would have a clue. The goaltending coaches will know for sure. I don't think the head coaches will know. And I think they would go snaptastic because there's such a fine line here, isn't there? There's not a lot of time once we get going. Oh, oh, wait. So, so, well, so, no, no. I, only I got, forgot sorry. to say this. Listen, no, I only got six minutes in my first answer, boys. You know I need more time. No, but, You didn't tell us the I'm color actually, of his Well, he's placed for the Flames. I don't think it takes much. Um, guys, I'm, I have a question for you. In that vein, Darren, if, if we're going to see head coaches be like, what? What's he doing? Snaptastic. Like Woody, yeah. when the things don't go well and he breaks headphones, like that type of reaction. Here's a question for you. Do you guys see a switch? Because we are for sure, I should have mentioned this, we are for sure seeing guys that are going to switch to Lefebvre during this break. But do we see that as a switch? I mean, yes, it's a different gear company, and maybe a coach is going to be like, what the hell, if he, if he I does I see that notice. as a tweak. Okay. Because in fairness to Lefebvre, like I should say too, in fairness to them, the new pad is different. So you've seen like Corey Crawford go from a premier um, to their new, I think it's 20.1. Um, and that is a bit of a difference. They have, and credit to them, they've got a new shin system around there. Uh, one with padding on the inside that is an interesting way of getting around pillows, to be honest. But um, it's, and so that is a different pad. But I think to me, I guess I don't see it as a big a switch because especially with the glove, like we talked to Pekka, like with Pekka, he thought everything was fine with the CCM made offshore. The glove felt slightly different and that's enough to see him change. UC Saros, we talked to him. Couldn't tell. Couldn't tell. When you say change, he wears a Lefebvre glove now. He's trying the Lefebvre okay. pads, the whole thing over in Finland. I haven't seen him since he got back. Okay. I haven't sent him a text yet to ask. But I like. I think for a lot of guys, the hardest thing to replicate the feel of is the glove. A little bit of tweaks to the pads are no big deal. The glove is the hardest thing to replicate. And when I think of Lefebvre having made these gloves for these guys for all these years, to me, them s- staying with him as a manufacturer under a different name, I just don't view it as a giant gear switch even though for sure it's a big deal in the goalie geek world no question and deservedly so it's a long-standing you know it's a long-standing pad builder bringing back his own name that's a big story but i I just don't see it the same way as a switch let me let me go back to the coach's opinion and the reaction and hutch i'll start with you and woody follow up if you're a goalie coach and your net miner switches manufacturers coming out of the pause do you tell your head coach or do you try and let it slide Ooh, there's a good one i think i probably try and let it slide especially if well you got to know your head coach but if 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 it's as i suspect and they don't even notice no we're not going to bother them with that if no way they notice you explain it, right like hey it's not that big a deal he wore you know like this is the reality it's we all tinker with no, things. No, but coaches, coaches normal. don't want to be tinkering. Coaches don't want to change. No, no. They want their goaltender no, dialed in no. and using the stuff that was making that goaltender play well before. Okay, so I will. Here's why I think it. No goal, no coach outside of the goalie coach is going to notice. I don't think they say anything because I don't think they notice. Because I'm sorry, but Corey Crawford switching mid period after going yeah. to going to something new. And then switching out of it. And Robin Leonard's done that before too, right? In the middle of a period. 
I'm I'm sorry, man. Like if that didn't create, that didn't get anyone's attention. There were no headlines. There were no stories. Nobody even wasn't asked the playoffs about it. though. I know. I know. no, but Darren, but Darren's on to something. That would have been a great question to ask their head coaches after a game. How did you feel? Here's the reality: not a single person in the media noticed outside of the counts that I mentioned. Guys like goalie gear nerd that do such a good job. The goal net and us. Um, outside of that, like. The media, the people that cover and ask those questions, did not notice. I I know this because I asked them. I asked them if they'd asked the question. As a matter of fact, I had somebody ask him about it for me. Um, you know, during that switch, I actually wonder whether it was legal. And then I thought, why wouldn't it be legal? Why couldn't you switch? You can switch every other piece of equipment. Guys, change yeah, their yeah, gloves. Could, I mean, know, always players switch them out because they're I, wet. I don't even whatever. know why I, I thought of it, but. Uh, I question things sometimes. Uh, J.P. Lamaru is our feature interview this week, and uh, this is a, an hour-long interview that covers uh, the globe, really. It, it it goes around the world and centers on Grand Forks and then spans out uh, from that. Uh, goaltenders, uh, if you're a fan of Ed Belfour, he uh, figures prominently in this discussion. Uh, Dominic Hasek is brought up uh, as well. It's a, it's a really fascinating interview uh, about a goaltender that, uh, that made the jump to Europe very early in his professional career. Uh, just a little bit of background on J.P. Lamaru Woody. Well, I mean, obviously, he had a hell of a career at North Dakota, University of North Dakota. Um, he's going he's gonna to tell you some of the names he played with there, but there's some big ones. Final season in 07-08, 9.32 save percentage, which gets a, lo- which gets a lot of attention. Um, ends up turning pro uh, and, and immediate success. Like goalie of the year in the East Coast Hockey League is a first year pro. Takes him to game seven of, of, of the finals. Uh, and then, you know, like he's five foot ten and getting a contract wasn't easy. And so I, there are some fascinating parts. I'm going to leave it for the interview and let people hear it there. But to me, especially later on when he talks about the conversation he had with Ed Belfour, who was doing some consulting with an NHL team where Belfour was in his corner and the numbers backed him up as a guy that should get a shot. And the general manager just quite frankly said there was no way in hell that a, that a goalie that size was going to get that opportunity. And that's when he realized early on time to go to Europe. Um, and I mean, just a hell of a career over there. Um, he has, as he said, stayed in Austria. It's been a decade now, 946 last season. And I know he didn't want to dwell too much on the numbers, but guys, like 946, 946, like that just doesn't. That's almost good. Yeah, like that doesn't happen. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's not a blip, man. It's not a one-year thing. He played 34 games last year. You know, his lowest save percentage over, over in Austria is 913, 932, 928, 932. Like he's had a hell of a career over there. Um, he's a heck of a goalie. And as you'll hear in this interview, uh, he's a really good thinker of the position. A really smart goaltender, and he's one of those guys that we love at Ingle. No stone unturned. Whether it's between the pipes or between the ears, he's always looking for different things to get better. He's engaging in conversations with people around the world about the position. He just loves goaltending, and that's why he was such a good guy to talk to. And while he came up short uh, in uh, his National Hockey League aspirations, uh, he stands tall right now over a decade in Austria. Here's J.P. Lamoureux talking drills, talking teammates, and talking a career path with Kevin Woodley on In Goal Radio, the podcast. Okay, special welcome to the In Goal Radio podcast to J.P. Lamoureux. Let's start off. Did I just say that right? Just depending on what part of the country you're in. um, How do do you say it in North Dakota? How do you say it in Austria? Yeah, North Dakota, they say Lamoureux. And then uh, they really get the throat into it in, in Austria, Lamoureux. So they really get the throat into it. My, my six-year-old son can actually say it pretty good because he's got a little bit of German under his belt. Okay. Okay. So I, I butcher, I've become like the Don Cherry of the Ingo Radio podcast. I butcher names even with guys that I know. And we go back a little bit, JP. It's been a while. But the Abbots, I remember talking to you at, with the Abbotsford Heat way back in 2010-11, which is your last season in North America. Uh, come out of North Dakota, um, University of North Dakota, played a little pro over here in North America, but you've spent the last decade playing in Austria. So I want to catch up with you on all those experiences, um, 
dominant last season in Austria. As a matter of fact, the second goaltender in the history of the league to win the actual league MVP award, the equivalent, I guess, of the NHL's Hart Trophy uh, for, for, the, for the Austrian Pro League. Um, catch us up. That is a long time. But that that path, as big and broad and stupid a question as that is on my part to sort of catch us up, like the road from starting in minor pro over here to, to heading overseas and, and what it's been like. Um, well, it's been uh, a really enjoyable ride. So I'm going in my 13th year pro, uh, like you said, 10th year over in Europe. Um, all those 10 years have been in Austria. Um, I've played in f- for four different teams. Um, Started, uh, like you, like you mentioned, uh, played four years at university of North Dakota. Um, was, that was kind of what my dream school to go to, um, played with a lot of really high end NHL talent there. So just being exposed to those types of players. So players from my generation that, you know, when you talk about North Dakota, people kind of want to put, okay, what era were you in? I was in kind of the TJ Oshie, Jonathan Taves, Matt Green, Travis Ajak, Drew Stafford. So all these guys that are, you know, real close to a thousand games, multiple Stanley cups. So that was kind of my area of North Dakota hockey. Um, and then uh, signed uh, my first pro contract with St. Louis and then spent the whole year in the East Coast League in, in Alaska. Um, had a, was disappointed that I never really got an opportunity in the American League. Um, but my experience playing for the Aces was awesome. Uh, we had a great team. We lost in game seven of the finals that year to uh, uh, a pretty good goalie in James Reimer, who was playing for South Carolina at the, at, at the time. And, uh, and then, uh, kind of parlayed that to, uh, signing with Buffalo the following year where I was, uh, kind of relegated to backup minutes to Jonas Enroth, a young Swedish goalie at the time who was, who was pretty good. Um, and then last year, like you mentioned, uh, my last year in North America was, uh, kind of backup role to Leland Irving, who was another good, uh, prospect with, with Calgary. I was going to say, heard of, heard of all those, heard of them, right? Heard of them, heard of them as you're going through the names. Yeah. Um, some big names there. And, and, and it's interesting because when I look at that short stint over here, you mentioned the first year in Alaska, like 923. And I know numbers like, you know, we all want context to judge goaltending numbers and more context is, is usually necessary. But, you know, Utah in 2010-11, when you, when you were in the coast, 919. And when you're in the AHL, under trying circumstances, if I remember correctly, in terms of the amount of goalies rolling through Abbotsford, um, 915. So you have all that success. And then you go to Europe. Was there, what was it that took you overseas earlier? Like what led you to not give it a longer shot over here? Uh, to be honest, it was a conversation with Ian Clark. So um, he kind of reached out to me through email and said, hey, I, I got, uh, at, at the time he was starting to work with Hockey Sweden. And in particular, he was starting to mentor some coaches in Sweden. He was working with Mask and Swooch, who at the time was with Moto. Um, he's since moved on, I think he's still in Firestad. Could be wrong there. But, uh, but anyways, he, he said, I might have an opportunity for you in Moto. I think, uh, he kinda, as you know, Ian, he puts things pretty bluntly. He's like, you know, you can keep banging your head up against the cement wall um, for as long. But he's like, I really think you got a future in Europe. I think your game will translate really well um, over there. Just um, for, you know, a, a lot of your uh, listeners, you know, probably aren't too familiar with me, but um, I'm an undersized goalie. I think I read the play well, very good laterally. Um, and, uh, it, it suited my game kind of making that transition. Um, but to kind of wrap it up, I was originally trying to get a job in moto. Um, but then that kind of fell through. They ended up bringing back, uh, another pretty good goalie in Michael Telquist, um, Heard of him. long time NHL goalie. So he ended up, uh, kind of taking that job in, in moto at, uh, at that season. And then I was kind of, just looking for, for a job in Europe and then ended up getting um, signing in Austria and uh, played for a team in Ljubljana, Slovenia. Um, so our, the unique thing with our league in Austria is that it's international. So there's you know, anywhere from four to five different countries that, that participate in the league. And uh, at that time, uh, there was a team in Slovenia and uh, that was my, my first opportunity. So it was uh, from there, I've, I've kind of you know, the plan was never really to stay as long as I have, but that's just the way it's worked out. And I've always kind of had the mindset of you just have to go where somebody says yes to you. And uh, that's where my opportunity was. So I was just, uh, I just wanted to make the most of it. And like, and like kind of Ian said, you know, you can really make a career over in, in Europe. And that was kind of my, my starting point. Well, it's been a hell of a career over there so far. Like I said, uh, right up until last year, even 946, like I, those are, those are video game numbers, man. So 
Um, and that's when you set the D to really hard to get those kind of numbers in video games. So um, I want to get into sort of the evolution, but I don't want to skip over the size part because you mentioned it, undersized, five foot ten. I wondered how much of that was at a time when the NHL is trending, uh, to me, at times ignorantly towards bigger goaltenders. Like the, there seems to be... Um, a margin for error that the really, really big guys are, are given that maybe doesn't necessarily match the success they have, and yet we see it continue. How much of that was like when Ian said banging your head against the wall? How much was it being five foot ten that, in terms of opportunities, maybe not matching the the performance and the numbers you were putting up the first couple of years here? Yeah. So when I first started working with Ian, and this is goes back to uh, two thousand six, two thousand seven, and uh, you know, he, he has a, a really articulate way of um, explaining um, maybe things that you don't want to hear, but are that, that you need to hear. And, um, and it for sure was a factor. And just here, like, here's just an example. So um, I actually have a, a, a somewhat of a relationship with Ed Belfort. He is a former North Dakota goalie. Um, when I signed with St. Louis, they also signed another pretty good goalie in Ben Bishop, who at the time was... Uh, the uh, the tallest goalie I think to to play in the NHL, and uh, Eddie was actually hired as a, a, a goaltending consultant. I think that was like his his title with with St. Louis, and he was actually pushing for me to to be in the American League that year. And he actually told me this in a conversation we had, uh, you know, couple couple summers later, because he always kind of makes his way up to Grand Forks, North Dakota, kind of every every few summers. But um, spoke to him a little bit about it. And he's like, you know what? I was pushing for you, you know, talk to Doug Armstrong. And basically what Armstrong's words were, were just like, I'm not giving an F and under six foot goalie uh, games in the American league when we got, you know, Ben Bishop, a guy that they really liked um, in the system. So, you know, it was basically like, yeah, it was great that I was in the, in the system, but you know, they really had no, no plans for me. And it didn't really matter um, what I produced, even though it was ended up being goalie of the year. We went to the finals, um, led the league in wins and, and, you know, but, but again, it, it parlayed to a different opportunity in Buffalo. Um, and even in there, you know, I was paired up with Enroth, who was my size, um, but four years younger. Um, but again, it was, there was almost a mindset of like, we can't have two small undersized guys in our organization when at the time it was Ryan Miller and Patrick Lean were the one, two, you know, both guys, six, three plus. And, uh, and it's just, it's just kind of a hard reality that undersized goalies need to, I think, just acknowledge when they kind of start their pro career, start that pro clock is that you have to do basically a time and a half more than, than anybody else. And I think when you can let go of like, this isn't fair and just go in and do the work, I really think you're going to uh, kind of hit new heights with, with where you think your ceiling is. It's funny you mentioned Ian Clark and obviously uh, we should probably introduce that background. You, you like uh, people know that I have a relationship with him, former goalie coach of the Vancouver Canucks. Now again, goalie coach of the Vancouver Canucks, um, used to run a school called GDI, a program called GDI, which is where I think you and him first hooked up. So uh, as much as uh, in my first sort of introduction to you was uh, as part of the sort of the Calgary Flames organization or with the Abbotsford Heat that year, um, you know, I knew of you at North Dakota and obviously all the success you had there and through uh, your ties to Ian and working with his school. So just to give everybody that background, what what in your mind, as much as getting over the mental side of it and, and not con- not thinking too much about it as a small goalie, like what are there advan- can there be advantages of being a small goalie? Like how have you navigated pro at this high a level with this much success despite that stigma that gets attached to it? How do you how do you teach? Actually, maybe the better question is because you run schools, you have you have your schools throughout the summer. How do you? How do you, what message do you give to your other goalies that are going through the same things where, where size is maybe preventing them from getting opportunities or how they manage their size in the crease? Well, I think you just need to adapt your game so that you have success. And then once you have that plan in place, you're going to feel more confident. And if you're going to, if you allow size to be a factor, it will be. And if you allow size to not be a factor, it will be. So it's, um, uh, a great quote from a, another mentor of mine from North Dakota, Carl Gehring, is he used to always tell people, you know, the puck doesn't know how big I am. So just as long as we're in position and, you know, I think some, uh, some powerful techniques that have kind of evolved over the last 10 years too, just understanding box control, puck angle, um, having uh, your, your 
uh, head trajectory over top of the puck, like all these little techniques can be really powerful in, in filling space. And, and especially when you see a lot of clips from that, from that puck angle, you realize like, man, I don't have to move as much as I think I do. And just as long as you kind of understand, okay, this is where I need to adapt my depth. Um, this is where I can maybe activate my hands to eliminate vertical angle. You know, you, you, you start to kind of uh, understand yourself and how you fill space most efficiently. And, uh, and you can really just kind of make size obsolete. And um, for, for smaller guys, you know, we have to excel at the easy areas. We have to catch and direct pucks really well. We need to be able to absorb in our body and then having good stick on puck skills. So if you can excel at those areas first and kind of build out from that, you know, um, entering in, you know, really good net play tactics, you know, post integration, have, having clean at entries and exits, um, you know, th then all of a sudden it's just like, hey, this guy's just a really good goalie. And, and you can kind of get over that. It's funny because uh, to go back to Clarky, I think he was the one that gave me the quote. Like there's, there is sort of a window of size that might be, you know, 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, but if you're bigger than that and if you're smaller than that by a couple of inches, you have to work through your size on both ends of the scale. It's just that the guys that are bigger seem to get the opportunity to do so more often than the guys that are smaller. Uh, a big part of that I do think is, like you said, understanding not just how much net you fill relative to the puck, but how to close that net efficiently, not to open up holes, not to reach, not to think you have to move more than you do, which tends to do all those things, open up holes. How much do you use video to teach that? How much of it was part of your learning process in terms of taking away net? And when did you sort of first understand that I do take up this much net? I, I don't have to move as much. And how did you kind of come to that? Uh, well, at first, when I, my first camp working with Ian, we were just working on kind of dead angle um, overlap plays. And the first drill that we did was just trying to have discipline, not reacting to wide pucks. So then just having the understanding of shots along the ice, uh, this is how far I need to react to actually fill space. Anything that's going wide, I'm actually booting out right into the slot. So just starting from there and then kind of the evolution of the iPad and being able to bring that on the ice. And then all of a sudden you're getting real-time feedback during practice. And, and I, I find that to be a real powerful tool, you know, and then, uh, the, uh, pr probably the last, I mean, I didn't even know when box control started getting presented say online and, and with coaches, but you know, I want four or five years ago, six years ago, maybe, but, uh, and then just being able to see that in real time in a practice where you're setting up kind of your box and, and understanding like, okay, this is where, this is how, uh, far out I need to be to basically be eliminating all vertical angle. Um, and it's, it's pretty powerful. Um, we, you know, with our goalie coach in Salzburg, Marcus Kirschbaumer, you know, we, we pick a couple of days during training camp and we just, you know, it's not a heavy workload, but we're just working on boss control stuff so that we're just like, okay, I have a really good feeling of, of where my angles are. And it really helps, I think with, with the tracking and Hey, I just, as long as I hit my spots, um, you know, I'm keeping my, my head over top of my knees and, and my hands forward. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to fill space and make uh, high quality first saves. That um, you've had a chance to, you know, uh, work with Thomas Magnuson from Sweden. You talked about box control. And I think that was where the first time we sort of saw it presented in that way online was probably through the network goaltending symposiums. I know you've had a chance to be a part of um, Justin Goldman's uh, retreat, uh, global goalie retreat in Breckenridge and, and had a chance to, to talk and, and work with Thomas there as well. Um, and, and at the same time, I've seen, I remember Pete Peters way back in the day with like fishing rods and lines in when he was coaching the Edmonton Oilers, sort of the same kind of concept, just not presented in the same way. Um, how do you present it to kids? Is it just, is it just a matter of iPads and, and things like that to sort of allow them to see it in real time? Has that been the biggest sort of step from, you know, someone pulling out fishing lines even 10, 15 years ago and how we're able to sort of envision it now is it even for younger goaltenders well the funny thing is if you talk about bringing out the fishing line so the first person like indirectly who taught me that was my dad actually uh, my dad was a goaltender at university of north dakota but what he did was he took out like uh like ski rope so like from water skiing rope and he put around the post and it, we weren't so much teaching uh, uh filling the net uh from a vertical sense but where i can stay on my feet and so, uh, you know, I'm going back to like 80s, 90s style goaltending here. That's, that's what I grew up with. And it was, okay, you're, you're tracking somebody going laterally and you're trying to hold your feet as long as possible. And you're kind of doing the, the Billy Ranford where you're, you're kind of opened up towards the corner and you're doing like almost like this T-glide shuffle. And then, 
you know, if they throw it back, you're kind of throwing your, uh, your back leg back. Um, if they try to go around you, it's then it's, you know, you're almost into a sprawl, but it was just basically, you know, you, you just do a simple shuffling drill and okay, this is how far I need to be to hold my feet and make the save on my feet. So that's kind of what I grew up with it, but into, uh, kind of this more modern era, it was, um, you know, I think, uh, I, I, it's just so, it's so interesting. It's been presented to me so many different times. So I can't really think of the first time I actually saw it, but, um, you know, we talked a lot about it in Breckenridge. Um, you know, there's been some, a lot of great coaches just on YouTube. If you, even if you, you Google it on YouTube, there's uh, just a lot of great presentations of it that would be helpful to kids just to understand that. Um, and like I said, when, when we're in Salzburg, we, we get the iPads out and we bring the nets in to, to form the new post. And you realize like, okay, I don't have to move as much as I think I do. And you, you can fill space really efficiently and Hey, I just nothing through the body. And then again, it just comes back to just good stance fundamentals. Well, it's funny because Connor Hellebuck told us, I think it was last summer, he, we were talking about this. And for him, it was uh, when he was younger um, in Michigan, someone pulled out, you know, they have the small nets for the youth hockey and someone mm-hmm. pulled out the small net and just put it in front of him. And that's where the whole, in his mind, that's where the, the click was that small net in front of me, as opposed to the big six by four behind me. And I really don't need to worry about all this space behind me. If I'm closing off the path, it, it has to go through to get, get into that net in front of me. So it's an interesting concept, and I and the re- I didn't mean to bang it home so much, but the reason I'm curious is, like you said, we've seen a lot of different presentations on it. I'm more curious now. I've I've come around to the application and and wanting to know more about the application. We heard um, uh, from the University of of Maine. They were talking about uh, moving drills, having the posts set up, but having moving drills where guys were moving into that spot. So Jeremy Swayman. Uh, Alfie Michel, the goalie coach, they're talking about having Jeremy Swayman move into those spots. So it's not static because sometimes when we're work, we've seen people work on box control and it's always static, but now there's movement into that zone. So you're sort of setting those positions, but from a T push rather than just sitting in that spot and understanding. So I've, I've seen a lot of work overseas where it seems like they're always on their knees when they're working on box control. And to me, one of the big things is the ability to get to the ice without opening holes and so all the different applications of it, I'm fascinated. Are there any other lessons over the years? I mean, and and it's been you know a, a lot of years now that jump home for you in terms of ways of teaching it, ways of understanding it. Um, well, I think a big reason for my success is just I, I kind of keep reverting back to it, and I'm kind of almost beating a dead horse here. But um, my interaction with Ian really changed the trajectory of my career. Um, I, I thought you know playing USHL in my first three years of college, like. Um, you know, I, I thought I just naturally read the play pretty well. Um, you know, I, I could read the shot off the stick, um, had good instincts with that, felt pretty good on, on lateral plays, but I didn't really have a ton of structure. And, uh, and that, that's what Ian provided for me. Um, I actually had uh, some teammates that had known Ian um, from Shattuck St. Mary's. His, uh, one of his old uh, boys went to school there and um, they were just like, are you sure you want to go with him? Like he's going to carve you apart. And I'm like, yeah, it's exactly what I want. You know, if he's going to carve me apart, I'll give him the knife, you know? And, uh, and, and that's the sort of feedback that I was looking for, but he was able to kind of give me just a, a handful of things that helped systemize a couple of different reads for me and just allow me to be play a much more positional game, but then also allowed me to highlight kind of my natural attributes. So, um, you know, growing up, uh, in North Dakota, it was a lot of outdoor hockey. And so I, I grew up just, um, you know, just seeing a lot of different shots. And for me, it was just read the puck off the stick. If it's up high, try to stay on your feet. If it's down low, go down and use your butterfly. Um, you know, so just the, the, nat- the, the ability to read the puck off the stick, which is, a, I think it's really difficult to teach. You just really got to get the reps in it for, for younger goalies now, as opposed to, um, you know, just learning the, the, just the, the different movement techniques that we use nowadays and then teaching the net play tactics. So a um, big part of my success is just um, the, uh, the structure Ian instilled in my game um, got me to feel really good about the things I did well. Um, and then, you know, he was like, you, you need, really need to champion some of the, the, the one-off saves. So he had an awesome interview that you had earlier this winter, and he was kind of talking about kind of his, his six, seven – um, attributes that he tries to instill in his, in his, in his goalies that kind of have nothing to do with structure. So he kind of, um, I, I had a game, uh, a style of play that people would just say, it's like almost too flashy or, 
you know, I would make kind of, uh, be in positions, like put myself out of positions, but kind of save myself with just effort. And it was just like, Hey, that's great to have that in your toolbox, but let's just not rely on it for, you know, most of your saves. Right. If you were to compare you coming out of university to you now, what would be like, would it be night and day in terms of style? I mean, for, for starters, the gear would be night and day, but what, what would be different? Um, um, 13 years later. Uh, I mean, some of the net play tactics have changed for sure, but right. I think there's, there's a bigger evolution from junior to senior year than probably pro to probably first year pro to now. Um, so just, we, we, we weren't really teaching reverse VH, um, as strict as it's being taught now on dead angle plays and overlap it was definitely, you know, we were, we were being taught, you know, traditional VH saves on dead angle plays. Um, but, uh, just. I think more confidence playing deeper in the net, even as an undersized goalie. So just feeling like I'm in every play, like they can try to pass it around you, but I'm still, still in every play. And Ian really helped me um, feel confident on my knees on low plays, especially on net front scrambles. Um, being able to feel like, Hey, you know, the, the puck's kind of batting around, but I'm still in good position. And I have good, good tactical reads um, in, in those sort of ambiguous plays that you, that you'll get from, um, you know, net front traffic and stuff like that. So just learning uh, knee shuffles and backside pushes that, that really help um, uh, those parts of the game. We got into technique so quickly and got into a lot of that elements. I haven't even had you. You mentioned your dad and your dad was a goaltender. You grew up in a hockey family, six siblings, yeah. one of six siblings. You're the oldest one. Everyone played. Obviously, I think probably most people are going to know your youngest siblings. Uh, the twins, Jocelyn and Monique from the USA women's hockey program. Um, what was that like? Like, how did you become the goalie of the bunch? Was dad encouraging or did he not want his firstborn to be a goaltender? What made you fall in love with this position when you, especially as you, as everyone grew up and you ended up with all these younger brothers and sisters who, I mean, I guess that if nothing else, you had people to shoot on you. Yeah. So just for context, it was my, my folks had six kids in five years. And then like you mentioned, the youngest are the twins. And, um, it was kind of, uh, the joke in the, in the house from, uh, from our grandparents was dad calls, uh, grandma and grandpa who live in Alberta. And, uh, they're like, uh, Linda's pregnant again. And, uh, and like this time it's twins. So then dad just like, doesn't know what to do. He's just like, I guess I'll go find a second job then. So that was kind of the, the ongoing joke when the, when the twins were born, but, uh, but growing up in the family, it was, it was fun. There was always playmates. We always had games going. Like I said, we grew up playing outdoor hockey all the time. Um, in the summertime, it was street hockey. We would have organized, uh, a, we had a neighborhood street hockey league that we had with a couple of our neighborhood kids. Um, you know, it was, uh, you had to like, uh, do like a drawing or we had like a draft for who got the best goal equipment for, for that league. So, you know, important stuff. And, uh, and yeah, that's just kind of how we grew up. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it was amazing to watch Monique and Jocelyn, just their, uh, evolution and them help trying to help grow the women's sport. Um, obviously with the 2018 gold medal, it just, uh, couldn't have ended any better for them having been huge, uh, impact players on that game. Um, and then just being, right there with them while they're trying to train you know they they help me probably more than they know just uh skate early in the mornings during the summer to get my skill work in and uh you know before they you know the they both have kids now but uh before they were having kids they were probably my most reliable shooters to come out and help me do kind of bully practices so now how did you fall in love with the position itself was it because yeah. dad played or yeah yeah so dad uh dad was a uh played at uh, North Dakota in the late seventies, early eighties. Um, he actually played junior hockey with Mark Messier. So Doug Messier was his junior coach in Alberta. So my dad, my dad's from Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. Um, and then just when we grew up going to the, you know, he would play his men's league and he'd bring, you know, me and my two brothers uh, at the time to men's league and I'd watch him play. And, you know, the, the cliche fell in love with the equipment, love the mass, love the smell of the gear. Um, you know, carrying around, helping carry his goalie stick, wanting to wear the stuff in the driveway. Um, so definitely the gear and then just growing up a fan of the university, you don't have to go to hockey and going to the game, the, the college games, uh, here, and then just being drawn to the goaltenders. Um, and then I think just, uh, you know, 
the success Eddie Balfour had in Chicago coming out of the University of North Dakota, knowing that he came from here and, um, you know, he had his iconic Eagle mask. And I think, you know, as a young kid, you're, you're drawn to that sort of stuff. So it was, uh, he, he was one of my favorites growing up along with Mike Richter, who I love from New York. Um, and then obviously Patrick Waugh, Dominic Hasek, you know, those were kind of guys that, that I loved just watching. Um, I never really felt like I had uh, a favorite NHL team as much as I just loved watching certain goalies. So it was just like, if there was a goalie that was playing that I liked, that was, that was who I was kind of cheering for, hoping that they had a good game. Now, was there a point where when you were out, whether it was playing outside on the ice or playing outside in the driveway, where you were trying to be those guys or went from just whoever was on TV was the goalie you liked to looking for any style things or things they did in their game that you tried to emulate in yours? Oh, 100%. Just like every young kid, it's, you start, you want to emulate your idols. And I loved, uh, you know, when I was growing up, I was kind of taught to be more of a stand up goalie. And I love Mike Richter's style. Like just at, at the time, I mean, he was as technically efficient a stand up goalie as you could find along with, you know, say Kirk McLean, who was so smooth, but, but, um, you know, just, uh, Richter's battle mentality, just never out of a play, you know, full middle splits on breakaways and I love that but as I kind of got older I, I really loved watching Belfour's evolution as a goalie just the way he kind of uh, started elevating his his uh his chest and had a bigger presentation in the net just more efficient I think just uh, with limited movement um you know he was he was one of the first goalies to really utilize the paddle down on on jam plays in Chicago um and I just really enjoyed uh, kind of watching him, especially like his Dallas years. He was unbelievable. Um, and then, you know, his first two years in Toronto too, where, I mean, he played some of his best hockey of his career, you know, early in those years with Toronto. But um, I, I feel like he's, uh, and I, it's hard to say if he's underrated, but I think technically everyone always kind of thinks of Patrick Wall, but I think Eddie was right there. Well, and, and as you mentioned, Toronto, like he, you know, another guy that, I don't think it's a coincidence. The guys that stick around the longest are the ones that are willing to adjust and change. And and he evolved and made changes to his game at a time when, you know, a lot of guys would have just rested. Hey, I've, I've played this well and gotten this far. But as the game was changing and and things like proper leg recovery, which we now take for granted, weren't necessarily a staple for some of these guys. They they went to school and and made sure that they were keeping up with it. Yeah. So it's an interesting thing. I mentioned earlier that I have somewhat of a relationship with Eddie, but there was like three separate times that I got to skate with them. Um, uh, wh- twice when I was a junior player and then once in college. So his last year pro where he played in Lexan, Sweden, he actually, uh, he came and practiced with our, our team in, in North Dakota. So he practiced with us for uh, about 10 days and uh, he basically decided that, okay, I'm going to play one more year and I'm going to go over to Sweden. He ca- kind of came to us to kind of get ready to get in shape. And then just he was sitting next to me in the locker room, um, got to watch him prepare. And then, you know, this is a guy like, you know, I was taping his playoff games when he was in Dallas. So like those epic series with Colorado between him and Patrick Waugh. And, you know, I, when you talk about trying to emulate someone's style, like he was my guy. So that was a really neat experience to, uh, to just be seated next to him, talk to him. You know, you're, you're terrified to say anything to the guy at first, but, but just to watch him in practice. And um, the, the funny thing was, was uh, he came out and you could tell that he hadn't skated probably since the NHL season ended. And he came out in like the first day, two days, he was terrible. He was not good. Like he could just given up, just given up a lot of goals to the body. But I'll tell you this, like he came back Wednesday and you could tell he started to get a feel back. And then he was just like, nobody could score on him. He was just lights out. It was just like, okay, I'm going to flip the switch. I'm going to be, you know, show why I'm a Hall of Fame goalie, Stanley Cup winner, all this stuff. So it's just, uh, it's just kind of funny to see kind of how guys prepare. And, you know, he was an older goalie, you know, like I said, it was, it was his last year playing pro, but it was a, a really cool experience to just watch his process. And, and that's what I'm most interested with NHL goalies is I want to see what their process is, you know, how they prepare for games, what they're thinking. Um, during the game, in between periods, after goals, like how they respond to adversity. Like I just, I'm really interested in uh, in just athletes in general, their process to what what elevates them to success. Well, I was gonna, I wanted to ask you a little bit about. Uh, you talked about playing outdoors, and and we've talked a little bit before we started recording about play reading and using video to read the play. And you've mentioned a couple of times how reading the play is a real strength of yours. 
before we get to the mental game, which I know we want to talk about as well, and, and that aspect of preparation, how much do you think that play reading comes from like being younger and just going out and playing like the instinctual side of the game that I, I'm not sure a lot of kids get the opportunity anymore, right? Everything is structured when they hit the ice, whether it's goalie schools, goalie camps, or even once they hit the ice in minor hockey, there isn't as much of that just play. Do you think it's, I don't say harder, but they don't have that opportunity to develop the instinctual reads maybe as, as much as you might have grow, growing up and playing outdoors and in that more free open environment. And then part two of that is, if they don't, how do we help teach them? Yeah, that's a really good point. It's just, just the fact of the matter is it's kind of an issue with, you know, being involved with hockey development since 2012 um, on a serious level and then working with kind of the, the local area um, youth hockey here in, in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Um, it's something that comes up. It's, you know, we talk even about how do you, you have to almost manufacture cross training. And, uh, and then like you alluded to with, you know, the natural way to, to read plays. And that kind of comes to, you know, hockey IQ. Um, for me, it's just, it, it's almost subconscious. So like when I went to work with Ian, it was, you know, he, he, as long as he gave me a little more structure, as soon as I got to the shot lane, he didn't really have to worry about, um, you know, my ability to read it off the stick. And that's in, in a lot of cases now with hockey development, it's like, you're trying to teach the reverse. You got guys that can arrive to the shot lane, but then you know, they don't necessarily read it off the stick. Well, um, if something funny happens on the way to the net, like a weird deflection, you know, all of a sudden they're just kind of, they're almost stuck. Um, and then you really see a goalie's read ability or, or uh, ability to adapt on the fly, just on net front scrambles and, you know, their, uh, creative instincts, you know, and I think, you know, when you grow up and you idolize like Eddie and, and Hashik, and, you know, Hashik was never out of a play. He always kind of thought a step ahead of the play. Um, and then you try to emulate that as a young goalie playing street hockey. And you just, oh, I just want to make this, you know, Hashik barrel roll safe so bad. And, uh, and you know, it just, it kind of gets ingrained in your, your hockey DNA. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge. How, you know, how do we manufacture? And I think just one way is, um, you know, when you do set up your structured drills in, in a, a goalie practice or a camp, you know, you, you have one puck where it's just anything goes. And then you just try to say, Hey, you know, we'll, we'll have the structure of the drill, but as soon as the, the first shot is, it's just like anything goes, players can do whatever they want. And then all of a sudden it's just, you're, you're trying to put them in a, uh, uh, an environment where they can come up with creative solutions on the fly. So much of the game is between the ears, not just between the pipes. Like we can break down. I can, I can look at technique all I want, but I can't look in between the ears of a goaltender. Uh, how much of that have you studied, embraced, look for different? What are some of the different voices you've had over the years that have helped you with that mental side of things? Because I know it, it's something you said you've dug into, or what are some of the messages that you've learned that you think could help other people right away? Yeah, I think just almost having a plan for obstacles and plan for adversity. So there are a couple of different topics that I would encourage young goalies to kind of do your own research on. So a couple of things uh, I'll throw out there is number one, just visualization, and it can be a really powerful tool. I know Pete Fry's got a lot of uh, uh, great tools that are accessible to young goalies, um, but you can, re you can do a lot of different reading up on it. There's lots of good presentations on YouTube. Um, and then just integrating that into your pregame routine. Um, just some examples for, for what I use is, you know, I, I kind of have like a, a three to five minute visualization routine before I go on the ice for warmups. And that kind of helps uh, me get to that, men that mental level of, okay, I'm ready to perform. Um, I, have a, I, I know how I want to execute my, my system, my technique. And, you know, I'm, I'm ready to, to battle and, and then have, you know, uh, I, I'm open to, um, things that come up in the game. I'm ready for the adversity. I'm ready for players getting in my face. Um, you know, if I give up the first shot of the game, you know, I'm, I'm settled in, it's not going to bother me. So just almost prepping, prepping your mind for that. And then the other topic too, I would, uh, encourage goalies to read up on and do your own research on is uh, flow state. And, uh, there's, a, a Hungarian psychologist named Mihai, uh, sick check Mihai. And uh, he's done research since, you know, the, the mid 70s all the way through the 2000s, where he's just basically taking study of people operating um, at their most efficient and finding the most enjoyment in the tasks that they're doing. And they've kind of coined the, the term flow state in, uh, in for when people find enjoyment and, and 
optimal execution. And for us as goaltenders, you know, how, how is that app, app, uh, how can you apply it to, uh, to your game? And it's just uh, some triggers that can, can, um, can get you into a flow state mindset is just, uh, you know, one trick that I use is a cold shower before I start getting dressed. And it's just a mental trigger. Um, other one, too, I mentioned earlier, just a visualization routine that you can implement. Um, you know, mindful breathing, all those are good techniques. Um, things that I'm sure, you know, your audience has probably explored on their own already. But uh, those are all things that I try to incorporate and, you know, on a daily basis with, uh, with game prep. Oh, it's funny. I mean, you mentioned with uh, John Stevenson, I, I noticed that he's into, there's a lot of Wim Hof and we've talked to Carter Hart about the cold showers as well. It's interesting to hear that that can be part of, part of your routine as well. Cause it sounds like you've done a lot of work on this. The visualization thing, help me out here for young goaltenders that they hear the term visualization all the time. Can you, without giving too much away, JP, walk us through like what you're seeing? what you're trying to picture even in one minute of that five minute thing? Is it, is it mind's eye? Is it bird's eye view of yourself? What are you seeing as you, as you go through that routine? Yeah, that's a great question. It's um, you, you want to, first off, it, it's going to be trial and error. So don't, I, I, I would want young goaltenders to feel like, okay, it's not like you're going to have this thing dialed in right up, right out of the gate. So if it feels uncomfortable, um, you know, that's fine. You're, you're just going to have to continually evolve and add to it, subtract from it. Um, I think the biggest hurdle right away is, so I'm doing this while all my teammates around me are getting dressed. So I think the first big hurdle is to have the self-confidence and not have the embarrassment of like, okay, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to close my eyes for five minutes and all this, you know, the locker room chaos is going on around you. Um, just having the self-confidence to just get, just get to that place. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that. You can find a, a quiet area where you can do it, where maybe you're more comfortable. But for me, that, that, that's the most applicable for uh, my pregame prep. Um, but when I'm visualizing, I'm seeing it through my mask. So when you talk about uh, mind's eye, that's, that's kind of what I'm visualizing. That's what I'm seeing. So I'm going through my technical structure that I want to execute, you know, um, uh, tracking down the wall, T pushing, getting into the shot lane seeing the puck into, you know, all parts of my body, glove blocker, body, pad, stick, trying to visualize all that, um, getting into, you know, reverse VH and, and having a clean entry and exits. And um, I'll visualize special teams play. So on a pre-scout, I will kind of almost see the plays that I know that they're going to try to set up. So it's almost like I can pick up the pattern a little bit faster, um, ready to, uh, to, you know, a lot of teams are set up stuff on, say, like an overload on the half wall. So you got half wall goal line plays, you know, trying to go cross crease and, you know, getting specific. You know, those are the type of things that, uh, that I would try to visualize. Uh, and then the other powerful things would be, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the start of the game. You know, what am I doing at the start of puck drop? Um, and then the end of the game. Uh, visualizing, you know, winning the game, having your teammates surround you. Um, what does it feel like? Who's, who's acknowledging you and then acknowledging, you know, the other team talking to maybe friends or opponents that you respect after the game through the handshake line, things that they would say to you if you had a good game or vice versa, you know, those can be powerful triggers for people to essentially just get over that anxiety that you would feel um, playing uh, under, under a pressure pack situation. Um, and I think that's ultimately what goaltending is, is you're not, you don't end up playing against the other team. You're just, playing against your own anxieties and fears, you know, fear of, of losing and, and not living up or not um, playing at, at your standard. I was going to say that's uh, we've heard a lot of that. Like it's not just enough to, especially at the high end level, it's not just enough to be visualizing your game. If you really want to take it to the next level, work the pre-scout into it, look for position, like try and envision things that you expect to come in that game, you know, uh, opponent specific uh, plays and tendencies and things like that. So it's fascinating to hear that's exactly what you've been doing. Where, what's the support like in Europe? We've seen goalie coaching evolve over here. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that, you know, like when you were in Abbotsford, them having an American Hockey League goalie coach, it was Jordan Sigalette at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, he actually came in the year after. I left, okay. So we didn't have anybody. It was right. Know, so, it was Leland Irving, Matt Keeley, and we were kind of all, you know, we were trying to support each other. 
three young guys trying to learn the game without much help. And and we're not that far. Like, I think people don't realize we're not that far removed from it where they're. And even today, you in a time and era where over here, you guys will increasingly young players will start their goaltending career in the East Coast League because that's where the spots are. And it, it's not just like it's increasingly a place where teams put prospects. They don't necessarily get that help, even even still at the highest level. There are very few that go, you know, three deep in terms of goaltending coaches. So I'm curious what your experiences were going over there, what type of support there were, and what you've learned about, you know, how to manage your own game when you do have it, and how you work with different voices and different coaches when you did start to get that support. Yeah. So uh, most of my career, I was kind of on my own. It was maybe work or talk to a few people in the summer, and then okay, try to put together a mental plan going into the season. And then you're just on your own trying to manage it. Those, those highs and lows, you know, from juniors through college, didn't have anybody. My three years playing in three different NHL clubs, no support. Um, you know, you, you had the NHL guys that would try to pop in, you know, but I mean, you're talking like once or twice a season, you know, and that's not, that's not really enough for a young goaltender to, uh, to feel like you're supported or at least feel like you have a plan. Um, I got some good friends that are in that goaltender development position now at the NHL level. And topic conversation all the time. I think they're they're trending in the right way. So most NHL clubs now have somebody at least at the American League level. But at least when I was coming up, it was uh, you know if you're the guy that's playing a lot of games, you can at least get into some game rhythm and have a good feel. But if you're you know if you're one B or you're backup, it's really tough. I think to manage your game and, and to feel like you feel good when it's when you get the tap on the shoulder. Um, so I you know my would say my my biggest blemish and maybe why I didn't stick it out more in North America was my, my year in uh, Portland um, when I was playing for Buffalo's farm club. And, you know, Jonas was the guy, they wanted him to play 60 plus. And, you know, I was on the bench for just weeks and weeks at a time. Um, you know, I was uh, trying to do my best to, you know, prove that, you know, I'm coming off being goalie of the year and, and not getting much of a, a sniff at the American league level. And that was really hard to manage. And it would have been really helpful to have somebody there that, you know, maybe dial back your expectations. And like, hey, you know, I know you think you want to be 50-50 right now, but it's just not, it's not going to happen. It's not in the cards this year. Um, but let's get the most out of your game, what, what you can accomplish in a 20 to 25 games um, for the season. And, and that's really difficult to, for, for goalies to kind of accept. And sometimes you, you got to take a step back and, and say, okay, I'm going to kind of uh, humble my ego a little bit here. And, but it's going to be better for me in the long run. Um, but if you don't have that sounding board and, and have somebody in your corner, like, Hey, you know what? It's, you're taking a step back, but we got a plan for you. I think it goes a long way with, with the young goaltender. So going through that in Portland, um, was a big learning curve. And I think when I, you know, I put together a plan basically for myself going into that summer and I was like, okay, I know I'm going to be a backup with Calgary system. Um, how do I get the most out of the season? So just kind of on my own, I kind of, went through that process. And I think I was just, I was just in a much better headspace to be a better backup goalie. And I just felt way more prepared, even though I didn't have that support, just going through that experience and then still having the drive, like, okay, I was better at my role acceptance and uh, I was just way more productive. And it just, it just reflects in the numbers of of those, uh, of those seasons in, uh, in North America. But uh, I think the second part of your question was uh, support in Europe and the support in Europe is awesome. And that's a big reason why I've stayed had a goalie coach for every team that I played and played for in Europe. Um, been uh, partnered up with Marcus Kirschbaumer, um, went for my years in, in VLOC and now in Salzburg. Um, so I was in VLOC for four years and then now going to my second year here with, uh, with Salzburg Red Bull. Um, had some good goalie coaches when I was in Vienna and, uh, and just having daily support and a daily plan. And they do a really nice job of developing, not just the, the starting goalies, but the younger goalies in the, in the system too. And, um, there really is way more attention to detail, like way more access to video, um, pre-scouts, um, you know, having our 15, 20 minutes before and after practice, you know, even like, you know, those little pockets in practice where there's not a ton of action. It's like, Hey, let's get a couple reps of this in or how are you feeling with, with these sort of stuff. So, um, just having that, uh, that support that you're talking about, um, it definitely, um, invigorates me and like, Hey, this, you know, I'm, I'm still, still, uh, developing, still improving. And it's, it really goes a long way with younger goalies. So it's good to see that they're trending in the right way, but I still think there's uh, a ways to go with the support 
with nope. the development at the pro level. What's the setup like in Salzburg? Because if if I remember correctly, that's uh, that's a pretty state of the art. Like you guys have access to some pretty good facilities there. Um, maybe even video that records from multiple angles during practice, things like that. Are those the, that's a level of tool you have access to as a goalie over there? Yeah. So um, so Marcus, he's you know, we get to geek out, we get access to a lot of good tech stuff. So yeah, we'll set up, say a camera, um, that would be, you would basically see the whole zone from over top. So it basically be like, if you put it in the center ice scoreboard and it would just face the net and you could see the whole zone. So you can see the whole thing develop. So we have one there Then we actually have two cameras that would be on the blue line angle on top of the glass. So we'd be able to get those angles in practice. So you're getting to see stuff from the angle too. Um, and then he's, uh, for in-game stuff, at least for our home games, he's got a net cam. So behind the net camera um, that we'll get along with just the uh, game action. So it's, we get access to a lot of different stuff. You mentioned the, our facilities in Salzburg, are, they would rival any NHL practice facility. So they have the Red Bull Academy in Salzburg. Um, it's not just for hockey. There's uh, all professional soccer club operate out of there too. Um, the Munich Red Bull team in, in the German league, they'll do some of their training camp, um, at that facility. Um, it's, uh, they have two rinks there, um, probably like eight soccer fields. It seems like, so there's, it's, it's a lot of cool stuff. And then just, uh, it's nestled right in the Alps. So then you're just immersed in, in the mountains and it's very, very beautiful. That sounds like a pretty good place to go back to now. Um, you're heading back soon. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you know, the, the hockey world as we know it right now, obviously here in North America, we're kind of waiting on with everything that's going on with coronavirus and COVID and, uh, you would have been close to the outbreak there in Italy. But before we go there, I wanted to ask you, cause you still do camps. Um, you come back every summer, you got about 10 weeks of off season and you spend five of them in camps, working at camps and, and really bringing a high level, all these things we've talked about in terms of what what's really necessary to help young goaltenders you're bringing these to jpl goaltending camps in the summer five weeks of them half your summer what do you get out of it like where's is this part of a transition after playing wanting to coach or is is there something you still take out of that helps you get better by being a part of these camps and 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 working on that coaching side where do because not a lot of guys want to spend their half their off season coaching might be you and mitch corner the only two i know that would do this yeah so um my evolution into that was I was a, I've always kind of worked other people's camps in the summer as a player in college and all that, but I got organized in 2012 was the first year we did our first JPL camp. Um, and like you mentioned, we, st- I just started with one and then it's kind of evolved into five. Um, I started the JPL LLC with my wife, Kelly, who helps me kind of run the business side of stuff. Um, we operate out of Grand Forks, North Dakota. We do our primary camps out of there. I also do a, an outreach camp in rugby, North Dakota, which is a real small town. Um, real dinky rink, but we go, I go do a camp there with my brother, Mario, and then, uh, one in Las Vegas. So it's another kind of outreach, but destination place. Now is Vegas, are there multiple levels for Vegas? Do we have older goaltenders? It's an all encompassing camp. So we'll take 24 goalies. And then we basically try to get, you know, mites all the way up through say a midget, but we try to do, uh, four goalies per age group is, is kind of how we organize it. So you know, you'll have your group of four mites, group of four squirts, peewees, bantams, all the way up to midgets. So that's kind of how we try to organize that camp. So we might have to, sl- we might be able to slip a Darren Millard into one of those. Good. You can come bring your skates. Good to uh, help have you run a station. We're, we're going to so, get, we're, we, we may be taking you up on that one. So sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go through the rest. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then I do, uh, so I actually have my last camp of this summer, um, just called the JPL select camp. It's just an invite only. So it's a very small group. And the goal is just to help the the local re, uh, area goalies here who are playing junior hockey and college uh, commits, um, kind of get ready for their seasons. Um, and yeah, so that's rounds out about five camps that I do. I do uh, private training basically all the month of May. Um, although obviously with the COVID stuff, all that stuff got canceled and I only did um, basically my last three. So I did my youth camp, my elite camp here in June, and then rounding out the summer with the instruction with, uh, with our select camp here that will start next Monday. But, um, but yeah, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, wanting to take on that responsibility in the summer. Um, that was one thing I considered. I really considered, okay, am I going to get burnt out here? Am I just going to get too much hockey? And, uh, you know what, I, I just, I really enjoyed the process. I'm, 
pretty much at the rink every day anyway with um with my own training um i enjoy the training aspect i enjoy the the, the process of uh getting ready for another season um i haven't lost that drive yet so that's i think been a factor of why i've enjoyed the the camp process and then selfishly coaching young kids makes you a better goalie yourself um when you have to break it down to you know trying to teach somebody proper leg rotation or trying to teach somebody net play tactics and trying to get it down to the most basic introductory level. You're actually helping yourself. So it actually helps my game trying to, trying to teach the position. Um, so it's been, it's, I've kind of gotten back more, I think, than what I'm kind of giving out. It's, it's, I think it's made me uh, a, a smarter goalie. I think it's made me uh, appreciate the longevity that I've able to, uh, to have. And then, um, part of it too, is just, I've been really lucky. I'm an undersized goalie that's played 10 plus years pro and, um, didn't have a lot of access, um, to great information. And I feel like I've accumulated uh, a good amount of it over the years. And then this is kind of would be, you know, North Dakota is kind of, it, there's not a ton here for kids. And just the fact that I, I kind of have some of it and, and trying to, organize it in a way that can be really beneficial. And, you know, my, my goal is to try to help kids get division one scholarships and, and get their school paid for. And, uh, you know, we very proudly got, got our first, uh, division one commit that's coming to North Dakota. So they started, uh, Caleb Johnson's his name, um, finished his second year in the North American league, um, with the Minnesota wilderness. We think he's going to be in the USHL this year. And, um, yeah, he started coming to the camps when he was 11 years old and then now he's, he's committed. So it's the, the, the efforts kind of paid off for the long run. So that's been rewarding to see. Nice. And it sounds like, like from a coaching perspective, like you, everything you've said, like lifelong learner, like it's, it's fair to say that's how you embrace the position. What we love about it obviously is that it's always changing. There's always new ideas. There's never necessarily just one way to do things. And it sounds like you've embraced a similar philosophy in terms of finding different voices and taking what you can from them. Sure, and just always expanding your toolbox and just not only on the technical side, but there's different mental tricks, techniques that people are coming up with. Um, you know, you mentioned the cold exposure is starting to become more uh, prevalent information that people are looking into. Um, breathing techniques are really powerful and in, in kind of uh, achieving new heights with what your uh, physical output can be. Um, visualization techniques with elevating confidence. You know, these are all things that, you know, I try to package within the camps that kids can take a little bit of each and actually apply it to how they get ready for a game. Um, and then feel like, okay, when things go wrong and the wheels fall off, I, I have, uh, you know, I have the, the mental capability to, Hey, I can handle this adversity. You know, I got a plan for that. I'm, uh, I, I can be self-sufficient. So, uh, one of the big things with, that uh, the messages I tried to kids take with them is just be your own goalie coach during the year. You're not going to get support. It'd be great if, if you can have somebody come out with you, that's great. But most of the time you're not going to get that support. So at least be able to organize your time um, so that you feel productive when you leave, leave the rink and try to get bet, uh, you know, that 1% better each day. And you're just going to develop, I think more confident young people. And, um, and then you're giving them tools for life too. That'll help them have success outside of hockey. Okay, now to go back to going back uh, and, and heading back to Austria for another year, you're going back soon. Um, training camp sounds like starts like August 1st. You guys might be one of the first leagues back. You were also, as I mentioned earlier, one of the leagues that was, I would say, along with Switzerland. And we've had Mike Lawrence, uh, the goalie coach uh, in Lugano, on about what that was like playing in front of empty rinks because of the proximity to Italy and the outbreak there in the spring. Where's the mindset? How are you feeling about heading back and taking your family back? Uh, you mentioned your wife, Kelly, who's also an author, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and, and two kids back back to Europe right now. It, you know, At a time when it's blowing up over here, do you feel like it's actually maybe even more under control over there? Yeah, I think so. Um, what, we left uh, early March is when basically our first round of playoffs just canceled. Um, and we were, for sure we're going to get canceled because we have a team that's in Italy that participates in our league. And they, those, like everybody knows, Italy got crushed with this thing. Right. So we got, uh, so, so then we, we were out of there. We, we canceled our, our playoffs and then we're out of the country in six days. So you had mentioned, you know, when we were talking earlier that it was just a mad rush to get out of the country. I think we left the day before the, uh, the travel ban to get back into the U S. So that was kind of the big worry that we weren't going to be able to get back. But 
kind of rounding up the summer, things have really tailored off. It seems like it's really under control across Europe, at least in Austria, for sure. Um, you know, I, I feel fortunate that it's going to be somewhat of a return to normalcy, I think. You know, our, the plan is to have uh, our, our oldest uh, our oldest kid that's going to start school um, in September. So, and then our, our daughter is going to be starting a, a kindergarten group too. So there will be a little bit more normalcy when we get back to Salzburg, actually. So we're uh, kind of as a, as a family unit really excited to get back. What was it like uh, toward, like, did you end up playing any games without fans as in between that period of canceling playoffs or was it just like full, full gear to complete stop? Yeah. So we've, um, we still played in front of fans, but we just, it was just basically like a dead stop. So we played the first, we played our first three games of the first round. Um, and then we actually traveled on the road for game four, um, did a pregame skate, um, prepped, like we're going to play, you know, get ready for game four on the road. And then we show up for a pregame video meeting. And then that's kind of when they told us, Hey, the season's canceled. Everyone's going home. Uh, whole world's going to stop. So, and then even from that point, I mean, you don't, you don't really think it's, it hadn't hit North America at that point. So you're just like, Oh, I'll just go home and things will kind of be normal. But it was just, things were just getting started. Well, I was going to say, and North Dakota though, not like you've been in a safe environment this summer there with, with your family, we're kind of similar. I feel blessed up here in, in British Columbia and Vancouver. Um, it, we've, we've managed it well. Uh, we've been lucky in, I guess, in a lot of, in a lot of ways and just counting our blessings that, you know, able to stay in a safe environment. Um, heading back, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the book too. I want to make sure we give a chance to, uh, and, and plans for the future. Cause, uh, Kelly's done a children's book. Um, we, it's, uh, it's got a goalie, it's inside the net. It's got a little bit of a goalie theme in there and on the cover, great illustration. Walk, walk me through that process and, and how she got into that and what role, if any, you play in it and what you've got some future plans for, for some penmanship and authoring. Yeah. So my, my wife, Kelly just has very much an entrepreneurial mindset. And, uh, it's just, she, uh, you know, we had some, uh, we got a rental property that we have here in North Dakota and we kind of incurred some, some flooding damage. And she was just thinking of ways she can kind of make up some of the, the insurance costs that we didn't get from, from that flood. And she was just like, you know, we read children's books to our kids and I could write a children's book. And then it was just kind of one step at a time from there. And, um, you know, she just basically Googled like, how do I write a book? How do I release a book? That's just essentially how it started with her. And then she started with a, a storyline. She figured out the length that she wanted to do it. Um, the only thing I contributed to this process was I helped her out a little bit with the hockey lingo. Um, as you mentioned, her the first book she put out was called Inside the Net. It's a goalie-themed children's book. Um, she just released a second one called On the Blue Line, which is a defenseman-themed book. And then we have two more coming out here this year. Um, one's a forward-themed book. and The other one's a coaching theme. And so it'll finish out as kind of a four part series here. Um, if you search Kelly Lamru author on Amazon, um, books should come up and we'll make sure we put a link up. Yeah. And she, uh, yeah. And so she did all the illustrations, all the the storyline, the illustrations, um, all on my iPad and then, uh, put the, uh, just step by step submitted the, the manuscript to, uh, to Amazon. And then kind of, we were off from there. So then it was just getting hard copies delivered to us and then started with, um, kind of selling some of those to friends in Europe and then family friends. And then, you know, it's just kind of been a, a snowball effect of kind of getting some momentum and having, uh, hockey people enjoy it. And, um, it's a, you know, a short read great for, you know, kids five and under, um, it's funny, our, our six-year-old basically had the book memorized before we even started selling it to people. So it was just, uh, it was really neat to see that kind of come to fruition and just kind of speaks to her kind of go-getter mentality that she was able to kind of get this off the ground. Last one. And if I didn't have a last one, Darren would, would hammer me. It's kind of become my thing. So even though we're approaching an hour here, um, any thoughts like, like when you have a season like you did last year and you've, you've had so much success over there. And I think people over here need to realize how high a level the Austrian league is as well in terms of where it, where it plays out in, in Europe. Some other names that you mentioned were over there last year from a goal attending perspective, uh, Jeff Glass, um, Leland Irving, uh, some really high end talent over there. Do you ever, do you ever think at all about coming back or, or is the life you've, you've created over there? I mean, when you describe it to me, it's like, why the hell would you ever leave? Yeah, it's been, um, you know, I've had possible opportunities to go to different leagues in Europe and they just, uh, 
you know, the, the cons outweighed the pros for leaving just the situation in Austria is really good. Um, you know, I had a, a possible opportunity to go to Sweden one year and then it just did, like, kind of like the first time it just kind of didn't work out. They ended up going with a different guy. Um, but we're really happy with kind of the decision that I've made to, to, to make a career in Austria. You know, I, if I had an opportunity to sign with an NHL club and there was some sort of, if a team thought that, Hey, you know, he, he can contribute or he can play. Um, I would for sure give it an opportunity, uh, take a look at that opportunity. No question. Cause you know, the dream is to, to play in the national hockey league. And, um, I got a lot of friends that, that play uh, American league, NHL, um, you know, impactful people in the NHL. And I, I firmly believe in my ability that, you know, I can go in there and I, I can play and do well. Um, I just never really had the opportunity to do it. So like, kind of, like I said earlier in the, in the interview, you just have to go where somebody says yes to you. And it's just, it hasn't really happened in at North America and Europe is kind of where I've had my opportunities. So, um, you know, it's, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to still play. Um, I don't take it for granted for, for one second. Um, I've had a lot of friends that played for a little bit and then, you know, then the career was just, it was just done. So just, uh, I'm really trying to fight for each season. And, uh, I've, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed the ride, even though it's, you know, I never planned on playing in Austria, you know, when I started the career, it was, you can't really say that's the goal, but again, that's where the opportunities led. I was going to say like weird year to have it happen in terms of like over here, people don't even know what they're doing in terms of next year and contracts and free agency. But I got to think if there's ever something that's going to, a 946 is going to raise, raise some eyebrows. It has to. That's that's like I said, those are video game numbers. Those just don't, that just doesn't happen. Well, it's, you know, it was, um, I, w- I did an interview with the local paper here in Grand Forks and we, he asked me a little bit about that. And I, I can honestly say like my, my goal was to actually exceed my, my career high save percentage, which was, I was wanted to shoot for like kind of like a 935. And, you know, you mentioned it's just save percentage. It's, it's not a perfect statistic, but you know, you can kind of generally gauge like, okay, I think this is my potential. I can be around here. So if I can get around that, you know, Hey, that's, uh, I'm going to be supported because Salzburg, we usually have pretty strong teams. Um, but, uh, but that was my general goal. And I, you know, the numbers are never at the forefront of my mind. My, my goal is to just, I want to play at my potential every single game. And then when the, you know, you shift your mindset to the process as opposed to the outcome, um, you know, that, that, that was kind of my goal. And you just, um, I had a really good routine with our goalie coach, uh, Kershey here, um, felt really good about, uh, my daily practice habits and then just felt really prepared for the game. So it was just, um, you know, combination of playing for a good organization. I felt good about my game. Um, you know, I was ready for, for adversity just cause I, I, I kind of know how the league plays out. I know in the Scott Darling interview it was, he mentioned just it, the, the league can be challenging. Like it can humble you in a hurry. And if you don't kind of respect the level of play, like you can kind of get exposed and it's very much an East West game. No question about it. Um, a lot of, sometimes I describe the league in certain games. It's like, it's like a cluster of turnovers before there's a breakaway or two on one or something. So that's kind of the type of hockey, but there's a lot of really good players that a lot of, you know, your North American fans wouldn't know about that are actually really good players. So Europe is kind of littered with in-betweeners and hidden gems. And a lot of these guys make a really good living and, and play at a really high level over here. So, um, you know, if somebody thinks of me as, Hey, this guy's a hidden gem, you know, that would be, a, I would take that as a really high compliment. I was going to say, it sounds like you got it. You got it all figured out at this point in terms of process and results and not focusing on the numbers. It's just up to us in the media to always focus on them. That's why we're such a pain in the ass. Um, listen, man, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been far too long since we've talked in person and and these days, zoom is as close as we get to in person. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Uh, Even though I was the one stumbling through it early with some bad questions, like a good goaltender, you, you, you basically carried us through this. Thanks JP for taking the time, man. I didn't mean for it to be this much, but I really appreciate it. I don't know. I know our audience is going to take a lot away from this and I can't thank you enough. And I hope we get to catch up again soon. Maybe with, uh, maybe with some of those video clips and we'll bring an Austrian flavor to the, uh, to the pro read segment at Ingle soon. Sure. I love that. Uh, really appreciative that you had me on as a guest. I'm a fan of the show. Um, and just, uh, I hope some of the younger viewers can take some of the things from my pro experience and kind of apply it to their own games. And, um, hopefully, we as a hockey community can get over this uh, COVID hump and then kind of get back to playing the game we love. Perfect. Well said. Thanks again, JP. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kevin.
Okay, I think that uh, that checked off all the boxes. Um, writing books, uh, drills, uh, Olympic uh, uh, siblings. Um, yeah, and a professional career. And thirty-five, one of the uh, one of the elder statesmen in the game, in a goaltender, and one of the first. Uh, we should also reiterate, Woody is uh, JP's one of the first guys we know going back to his league. Yeah, yeah, and that was uh, interesting. I mean, no hesitation either, right? And he's obviously in taking his family with him and heading back soon. And um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And obviously Austria, pretty close to where things were really bad there. And, you know, quite the juxtaposition um, to what's going on. Uh, actually, I was going to say south of the border here, but that's where you are, Darren. Kind of a juxtaposition of where to where you are in terms of, as we've seen the numbers here in Canada and elsewhere sort of stabilize and drop off. Um, they're going in the opposite direction. So as he said, uh, kind of fortunate, got out just just as things were getting really bad uh, in Italy and in, and in Europe, comes over here before it starts and is on his way out of here as it's starting to blow up again in North right. America. And he's looking forward to, he's going back to look forward to a little more normalcy. It's it's interesting how that works out. Well, and, and also too, he's going back to, and we touched on it there, like this Red Bull setup that they have, I've heard about this. I've talked to some oh, of the goalie amazing. coaches, but there's a reason Bobrovsky used to go there every summer for his, you know, pre, before he go, went back to Columbus, he'd go there and I think he spent a month there. Um, you know, and then we hear him describe the, te- you know, the, the city they live in and the, it sounds like a pretty, pretty good, pretty good lifestyle. I think Hutch, we know what we might have to do here. Um, I've, yeah, road trip. I think we need to get take take a road in trip. goal in person on the road uh, European tour. You got it. Um, once there's you tra- got it. Red Bull sounded a lot, an awful lot to me, like the uh, the U.S. Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, where I was lucky enough to work for for a year, and uh, all the tools that are there to help athletes become the best they can be. I was I was certainly jealous. I. I really came away from that interview with the impression that uh, I mean, if he's uh, a, a as good a communicator as he sounds like he is on that interview, Kevin, that uh, he's destined to be a really good coach in the future as well. Um, well, he may already be, right? I, you know, I think, well, no, but I mean, at the professional level, I mean, he's, he's certainly, as, as you mentioned, he is coaching, but I, I could actually see him becoming a, a high-level goalie coach. Um, you know, we can talk about what makes a great coach uh, in, in another episode, perhaps, but more than half of the goaltending coaches in the National Hockey League right now didn't ever play a game in the NHL, and a few of them uh, only played a few. Uh, I think quite often somebody like JP, who at 5'10 was was not quite the guy that people were looking at, uh, they look for every avenue they can to maximize their ability, and I think that makes them students of the game in a way that perhaps other guys who get more opportunities don't need to be and uh and so that that makes them outstanding coaches and and i think uh i think we could look for him someday in the future and with a pro the team last goaltender to win the mvp of the regular season in the Erstebank ice hockey liga in austria the top league in austria was our friend alex westland who is now the goaltending coach of the Hershey Bears, the Washington Capitals development goaltending go. coach. He's been in what that role that? for like three years. Uh, Alex was 2009, 2010 that he won that award. So it's it's huh. been basically a decade between goalies winning MVP awards there. And I uh, just thought that was an interesting tie-in as we talk about uh, JP going on to coach and obviously doing the coaching with his with his camps already. And yeah, the last guy to win it is already well on his way to uh, to a, an NHL coaching career working in the American League right now. I enjoyed the way he talked about meeting his hero and interacting with his hero at Belfort. Like even at he's in his mid thirties and he still he can t- still tell that there's a bit of fanboy in there. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, you know what? I think at the end of the day, just there's just a passion there for the position, yeah. right? Like he's he's gone to this. He mentioned uh, I don't know if he mentioned it during the interview, but he mentioned it when we were sort of priming for the interview. Like he he wasn't able he's not able to go regularly but he spent, he did the one year he went to the global goaltending retreat that Justin Goldman and the goalie guild run uh met Thomas Magnuson from Sweden who you know we've had on the podcast and anybody who meets him like just the passion for goaltending there and the conversations with him would have been fascinating and and JP looks for those opportunities and, and you tell what the the list of things he's reading there's just you know one of those perfect no stone unturned guys that uh, is always going to find new ways and I think Hutch is right there's probably a reason those guys make great coaches Hutch, we're doing our part on ingoalmag.com to uh, in- educate and inform uh, goaltenders in this world. Uh, so what's on the site right now? Got a whole lot of new stuff up there since you guys uh, ran the show without me last week. You were week. on assignment. And 
Yeah, I was. I was. We were actually over in Vancouver doing some some sort of finishing touches on the testing of the Axis line, and a couple of ice sessions over there with a few different goaltenders. So it was uh, it was a pretty awesome trip over there. Um, lot, lots of good stuff. Of course, the Axis review, as Woody's already mentioned, and we put a lot of time and energy into that. So if you want to learn a little bit more about it, I mean, we've heard from some of our retail friends that they actually make it mandatory reading for all their employees. If you want to know about the gear, it's all there. Uh, no, nobody can express it better than Woody does when he puts it into words. And and at a time when it's tough to get on the ice and, and find some opinions, we have managed to get several different opinions, both in the, the recent testing since we're back on the ice, as well as when we had our own uh, demo set earlier in the winter as well. So um, everything from minor hockey to AAA hockey to Junior A and even One Pro, uh, we managed to get in the gear. So definitely please check out the... Uh, the Axis review. Um, just to be clear, because we know not everybody who listens to this podcast is uh, an Ingold member yet, that review and all our reviews are open for everybody to read. You don't need to be an Ingold member. You can just go click on the article and you will see the entire uh, review and hopefully you'll, you'll think about becoming a member when you do that. And there's lots of other great stuff if you do choose to become a member. Um, we've got a couple of articles up now, a couple of long videos up on the site. Uh, from the WHL Hockey Canada Symposium that uh, we were a part of. And uh, you won't see that content anywhere else. It includes an interview with Carter Hart. It includes some uh, level one and two goaltending uh, curriculum from Pasco Valana and Brad Kirkwood of Hockey Canada. And uh, I've got a, a really surprisingly to me, I guess, because I wrote it, very popular article for In Goal Parents. I, uh, I penned another one and, and poured a lot of myself into it. And it seems really popular. And that's talking about um, your most important role as a parent. And uh, for me, that's helping your, your child with their mindset as a goaltender. We can maybe go down that road another after time. The game. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. But it's what you're talking about over oh, those Slurpees, okay. yeah, I think. That's point. really important. Yeah. At least I got half yeah, of it. Right? Yeah. 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 So we got, got into that. There's, uh, there's another pro read with Cal Peterson of the uh, Los Angeles Kings, a really neat and tidy pro read where he looks at uh, a very specific situation. And we got some more pro deals drills with uh, Roberto Luongo. So all kinds of great stuff up there. And we encourage everybody to You're check right. it that, out. You're uh, right. That conversation piece that, uh, that you wrote is, uh, is really fascinating as, as a, from the parent perspective. I know we, we dive into, oh, thank uh, you. Uh, and, and sort of aim a lot of, uh, the material towards goaltenders themselves, but the parent, uh, part of it can make, uh, make the relationship between your goaltender and, uh, and the, the parent so much, uh, so much better. And just, we all, we all need a little guidance. I think we all fret so much about how can I support my child? What gear do I have to get? What camps do I have to go to? What team should they play on? When in reality, I think the, the most bang for your buck is, is not spending a penny at all. It's just the time you spend with your child and how you choose to spend that can have a massive impact on, on their performance. I have no doubt at all. And I just talked about a bunch of those things in there. And I'm, I'm going to follow it up this weekend with a piece, um, just a little bit about anxiety and fear of missing out. Uh, over getting your kid on the ice at this time of year because um, the, the the general slant of it is that we were all sort of relieved of that difficult decision over spring hockey and we don't need to get into that right now but because we were all forced into one decision but now I, I know that some families are starting to feel a little bit tense because some kids are getting on the ice and some are not right now and uh, so we just talk about that a little bit. One of the longest episodes ever at Ingle Radio, the podcast. That's what this is right now. Is it? You guys know that? Yeah, it feels like it. Just wanted time flies when I you're know. having fun. Well, if we, if we want to break the record, if we want to break the record, do you have another Woody. question for me? Because it, it, it <laughs> just ask one more question. That's right. <laughs> just one more question. Just, just hey, if you had one more question for JP, well, two more questions because he asked her one more. What would it have been? That's a good one. You stumped me. Yeah. Yeah, I probably would. Have, you know what? We never talked gear. I probably would add ask some gear things. Oh yeah, and we we had pretty much everything else. He spanned uh, a lot of changes in gear over the course of his career, starting with uh, with UND and then yeah, and to I his was tr- try, trying to remember what he was in when he was here. No, you better be with, running the gear side Abbotsford. of this account now, Darren. If you yeah, know, well, I just know that's just based on age. That's, that's all I'm impressive. going by. Is is yeah. it, and it's nice to speak to a to a guy that's more in 
in our wheelhouse. Uh, great job with JP. That was uh, that was fascinating. I love these uh, these interviews of uh, people that, that I don't know as much about, but uh, I'm a big fan and uh, grew up in and around the uh, the UND program. So uh, that was uh, that was close, near and dear to my heart as well. So that was uh, that was cool for me. And uh, keep up the great work, Hutch, on the uh, on the parent side of things and uh, the content part of it at ingoldmag.com. We'll speak to you next week when we should know the hub cities and the schedule. Training camp will be right around the corner and uh, we will be a lot more dialed in on the National Hockey League's return to play. If we don't have that information, things aren't in a good spot. So I'm really hoping that that we will be. On behalf of uh, Kevin Woodley and David Hutchison, I'm Darren Millard. Thanks for listening to In Goal Radio, the podcast.